Good morning, or I should say good afternoon, folks. Hope you guys are well. Okay, the key was absent. Hey, Courtney, how are you? Hello, Shay. Yes, Courtney, you're doing well. My wife's feeling a whole lot better. Thank you. Appreciate that so much. Okay, let's see. Courtney's here. Shay is here. Hello, Shay. Shaniqua is here. Hi, Shaniqua. And I think we'll probably have it next uh, Thursday. Hi, Tamika. But then I don't run the show, you know. I just tell you a little bit about anatomy, and then they do the other stuff. Okay, Destiny. Hi, Katie, Jason. I appreciate that, Courtney. Figured out what was going on and putting her on some medication to, to help her uh, get over it. Let's see who else is here. Elizabeth. Hello, Elizabeth. <clears throat> Madison. Madison Becker. Hope you're well today. Well, we'll give them a few more minutes, <clears throat> see if some other folks come in. Let's see, Destiny was the last thing we talked about, uh, the brainstem. Hey, Donnie. Thank you. 
Okay, so <clears throat> so we were on the brain still. Okay, good. Do we cover the three parts, Tamika? Hi, James. Covered the uh, midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. That's some lunch. How about that? James. So did we mention, mention the uh, functions of the brain stem? Help you breathe in the ponds, and, um, auditory and visual reflexes in the midbrain and so forth. <clears throat> That's good. We didn't go into a whole lot of detail. We just mentioned those basic uh, functions. That's good. Okay. So did we look? We looked at. I think it's some pictures on page four thirty seven. So we looked at the brain stem from that perspective, didn't we? Just trying to make sure where we are. So the midbrain deals with visual and auditory reflexes. That's not all, but that's all I want you to know. And the <clears throat> pons helps control our breathing have a pneumotaxic center in that particular part of tissue. And then you have the medulla. You have some other reflexes like vomiting and so forth. Does that sound like what we finished on last time? The uh, <clears throat> medulla deals with breathing, heart activity, digestion, and things like that, right? Okay, well, let's get into it. So I want to make sure I uh, cover this with you. As you look on page 437, we're looking at a figure 12, 12, 12.12. 12. Good. Thank you, Jason. Did I get you to look, in addition to the brainstem, the sagittal picture that we have there of the brainstem, did we look at, I said, look up at the top image? And did we talk about the lateral ventricle up there to the left? Anybody remember that? We talked a bit about CF, CSF, okay. Well, let's just do a little review here. I don't think it'll take very long. So as you're on page 437, and we talked about that lateral ventricle. That's a cavity in this 
um, right cerebral hemisphere. You also have one in the left cerebral hemisphere. <clears throat> We've already talked about that. And you have a choroid plexus, which is a network of capillaries uh, in the brain, in that lateral ventricle, which produces cerebrospinal fluid. So you've got a, a network of capillaries that produce it. We'll see a little illustration of it in a few minutes, I think, unless we've covered it. So that, that fluid is produced in the lateral ventrals, right and left. There's also a network of capillaries in the third ventricle. When you look at that sagittal view, look over to the right till you find that bold print term that says diencephalon. And you know that's made up of the thalamus and the subthalamus and the epithalamus and the hypothalamus. But it also has a cavity in the middle of the thalamus. And that's the third ventricle. So you've got a lateral ventricle here, a lateral ventricle here, and you have a third ventricle in the midst of the thalamus. So that cavity in the where the thalamus is drains into what we call the cerebral aqueduct. That's over on the right-hand side. Uh, one of the four uh, terms on the right-hand side, lower of that upper picture. So that cerebrospinal fluid drains out of that third ventricle where the thalamus is. There's also a choroid plexus that produces the CSF there. And then you see that cerebral aqueduct goes down to the fourth ventricle. And eventually that will go into the central canal of the spinal cord, which I don't think we've talked about yet. Did we look at the picture on 441? It's figure 1216, page 441. Big, colorful picture. Now, we're not going to learn everything that's on there. But I want you to notice the, the blue sort of um, the figure's name, uh, Tamika, is the big picture on page 441. It's a, it takes up half, the top half of the page. And all it simply says is the big picture. And it is a big picture, half the page. And you can see a lot of structures inside the brain that we have identified. Now, we're not going to get into all of that. That's correct. 12, 12, 12 in the E text. Okay, thank you, Destiny. So you see those sort of blue curving. Uh, they sort of look like a, a wishbone. You guys ever pulled on a wishbone and did that thing like who was going to get married first or something like that? So that blue structure, there's two of them. There's one in the left hemisphere and there's one in the right hemisphere. Those are your lateral ventricles, those cavities within the brain. Keep it in mind. Keep it in mind. We're going to talk about them a little bit later now. We're going to move on and work toward um, getting the cerebrospinal uh, fluid flow in just a minute. Thank you, Destiny. So look on page 443, it's section 12.3, 
So it's protection of the brain. You already know the skull protects the brain. But we want to look at the membranes that protect the brain. So I want you to come down in that first column on page 443 under 12.3. 12.3 is a section of that chapter. You come down to the cranial meninges. Now imagine most of you have heard about the condition called meningitis, a very serious condition. But the meninges are the membranes that surround the brain and the spinal cord. So you want to know those. <clears throat> Excuse me. And you come down under cranial meninges and you see the bold print term, dura mater, tough womb. Some people used to call it tough mother. Mater sounds, you know, kind of like mother. So the outer membrane. This is all inside the skull, all inside the cranium. The outer membrane is tough, called the dura mater. You go up into the second column, and you see the term arachnoid mater. Some people just call it the arachnoid. It looks something like a spider web in there. And there's a space there that we're going to talk about a little bit in just a second. And then the the innermost menix, menix is singular for meninges, meninges, and you see it's the pia mater, and that's the um, tissue, the membrane that is directly on the brain. There is a space between the pia mater and the arachnoid mater, and that's called the subarachnoid space. And we're going to see we're going to see fluid in there in just a few minutes. So here's another. Um, well, we'll talk about is another homostatic mechanism in a little bit. Um, Got to have the right amount of fluid up here around the brain, around the spinal cord. You got too much, creates pressure, can damage tissue. Don't have enough, that can end up. Uh, damaging tissue by not supporting the delicate brain. Boy, it's amazing how many hits we can take in the head, and it is it is a delicate organism. But that fluid helps to protect us. Now, let's go over to page 445, and we're looking at figure 1219. Figure 1219 on page 445. So now you see this nice colorful picture at the bottom. The brain is sort of tan, uh, light brown, however you want to call it. And then you see the sort of blue green structures we saw back previously that look kind of like a wishbone. And so you've got two of those, one in each hemisphere. They're representing the cavities. And then when you come down um, where the, where the uh, lateral ventricles are like this, and then you, you have right in here this structure that kind of looks like a bird head, doesn't it? You can see that little brown, what we would think of as the eye. That's a piece of the thalamus. And then you look a little bit lower than that, and you see that two of them, and they look like a little beak. Well, see, that that's actually the third ventricle. So you got the two lateral ventricles, and then you have the third ventricle. Now, I want you to know something. Look up here. Look in the middle where you see lateral ventricles. Right in the middle at the top. Top of the picture now. Not top of the page, but top of the picture. And look right below lateral ventricles, and you see interventricular foramen. And a foramen is an opening, isn't it? We typically think of it as being in bone, but here's another opening, and it's not in bone. It's just that we've associated and taught you that probably in the lab, that a foramen is a hole through the bone. And so any cerebrospinal fluid produced in the lateral ventricles ends up 
going through the interventricular foramen into the third ventricle. <clears throat> now, some of you may be saying, how does it get up there from the lower um, parts of that lateral ventricle? Remember, the cells that have cilia and the cilia propel the cerebrospinal fluid. They move it toward a particular opening. How do they know how to do that? How come fluid doesn't get stuck down there in the bottom or something like that? Got those little ependymal cells. Remember that? Ependymal cells. We talked about them in chapter 11, I think it was. Just like the cilia in our respiratory tract, which we haven't talked about, but that cilia moves the mucus right up and we clear our throats and it actually helps to uh, keep the bacterial count uh, in our respiratory tract low. But the ependymal cells cause the current, push all that fluid through the interventricular foramen, and then you see that what looks like a skinny little neck under that bird head. That's the beginning of the cerebral aqueduct through which the CSF flows. It goes, in, uh, goes down to the fourth ventricle. And then the fourth ventricle goes into the center of the spinal cord. They call it the central canal. And so it'll run all the way down the cord and it'll come out at the bottom and so forth. And the cord is um, covered with the other uh, meninges, the pia mater, the arachnoid mater, and the dura mater. Now, what you don't see here in this picture, where you see fourth ventricle, and you know the fourth ventricle turns into the central canal in the spinal cord. We're going to look at that a little bit, just a few minutes. But there are three other openings in the fourth ventricle. And they lead, they let CSF fluid get into the subarachnoid space. Look over on page 446. Page 446, you're looking at figure 1220. You know, Destiny, you'd think they would have these things uh, all say the same numbers, wouldn't you? Just shows you they're not that the things put together by humans. We tend to make, just make things a little tougher for ourselves sometimes. Now, as you look at that picture, that's a sagittal section of the brain. Now, what I want you to do is look at that top sagittal section. Look to the left, and you see choroid plexuses of the lateral and third ventricle. That little red stuff that's in there. That's because it's a bunch of capillaries. CSF, cerebrospinal fluid, comes from capillaries, the blood capillaries. So we don't have any blood coming out of the capillaries in the sense of red cells and so forth, but the fluid comes out, and that fluid that comes out into the third or the lateral ventricles and the third ventricles, that's cerebrospinal fluid. It's kind of like plasma, isn't it? <laughs> Title of the figure, Courtney, 
uh, that we're looking at currently is formation and flow of CSF. It's figure 1220, formation and flow of the CSF. So you notice where it points from um, the left says choroid plexuses of the lateral and third ventricles. You can see the black arrows. Follow the arrows down into um, the cerebral aqueduct. 1224, boy, that's a lot. Oh my, you might, maybe we got a different edition or something like that. But I'm glad you got it, glad you found it. So come through the cerebral aqueduct, you're into the fourth ventricle, see the black arrow in the fourth ventricle. And then as it comes down underneath the cerebellum, you see if it goes straight down, it goes into the central canal. But look at that little turn to the right. That's one of those openings in the fourth ventricle. Mm -mm. You wonder how the how the openings are always produced in just the right place. Anyway, follow that arrow to the right, and you see it goes into a space. It's a challenge, isn't it, Courtney? Yeah, because my study guide's made out of my text. <laughs> I agree with you. So that space where you see that arrow coming out of the fourth ventricle and going to the right, that space where that arrow is leading into is the subarachnoid space. Filled with cerebrospinal fluid and the brain rests in that cerebrospinal fluid. It's not real thick, I mean, not real deep or whatever, but that's what our brain and our spinal cord float in. Now, I want you to look at the cerebrum and look at the blue around it. The blue that is around it is the light blue, not the kind of gray blue that's at the top. <clears throat> Hi, Madison. And that blue area where you see the black arrows moving, showing them a flow because of those ependymal cells, that's the subarachnoid space in which the brain rests and is held up by the fluid. So it's a cushion for us. Now we keep making this fluid all day long. So there's got to be a way for that fluid to get out and back into the circulatory system, the cardiovascular system, the blood, and so forth. And if you will look on the right-hand side of the cerebrum, come down to the last little line over there before you hit that kind of orangey line pointing down, and you see this term called arachnoid granulation. You see how it, um, you see a little black arrow going into the granulation? And that granulation is in a structure called the superior sagittal sinus. Look over to your left on that top picture, and you will see the word superior sagittal sinus. So here are these granulations that 
penetrate into the superior sagittal sinus. Now, when you think of sinus, we think of a cavity, don't we? Some of you had some sinus infections up here and down here. Well, <clears throat> this sinus is not a respiratory sinus, but it's a sinus in which blood flows through it. It's not a blood vessel, but it's a structure that catches the blood that has been pushed up to the brain, dropped off the oxygen and the nutrition it needs, picked up the carbon dioxide, picked up the waste products, and dumps it into the superior sagittal sinus. Now, you guys have, um, have you already, I think you've already had your lab test exam. Uh, maybe it's this week. But um, you remember how where the two, uh, two cerebral hemispheres come together? Got a longitudinal fissure there. There is a big structure over it. The dura mater helps to fix that, um, produce that structure. Look on page 444. Figure 12, 18. Uh, what I want you to focus on is the bottom picture. It's part C of figure 12, 18. And as you look right at the top of that bottom picture, you will see the word superior sagittal sinus. Title is structure of the cranial meninges and dural sinuses. Structure of the cranial meninges and dural sinuses. And so you see the superior sagittal sinus, and you see one of those arachnoid granulations penetrating into the superior sagittal sinus. And that's how cerebrospinal fluid gets out of the arachnoid space, the subarachnoid space, and the fluid flows through those granulations back to blood. So you think about it, you got a circulatory system here. The choroid plexuses in the first, second, well, two lateral ventricles, the third ventricle and the fourth ventricles produce the cerebrospinal fluid. And the ependymal cells are always waving like our cilia in our trachea and in our bronchi. They're always pushing in a certain area, certain way, and they make the fluid flow on the top of the brain underneath the arachnoid membrane, and then eventually it exits the subarachnoid space into the superior sagittal sinus. Anything that obstructs the flow of cerebrospinal fluid is going to create a problem for the brain. It's the same way if anything obstructs your respiratory tract. It's going to be difficult to get mucus out. It's going to be challenging to get fresh air into your lungs and get the air that's carrying carbon dioxide out. Don't want any uh, obstructions. Elizabeth, we're looking at that title. Uh, it says structure of the cranial meninges and dural sinuses. Structure of the cranial meninges and dural sinuses. Think you see the flow now? Where does CSF come from? Choroid plexus is in the two lateral ventricles, in the third ventricle, in the fourth ventricle. Why does it move? The pendimal cells that are ciliated are pushing it along. It goes down into the central canal, as we'll see in a few minutes, and it also gets out into the subarachnoid space. <laughs> Thank you, Destiny. 
Because it'd be a challenge how to say it three different ways. Someone catches on. That's good. I'm the same way. I have to hear it a few times. Okay. Everybody comfortable with that? So let's move on to page 448. <laughs> that's true you're right Destiny I mean Courtney I agree with you and titles help that's wonderful you figured some things out that's good girl so we're on 448 you look down at the bottom and you see the heading the spinal cord now all of you know where that is but what we want to do is look at some specifics about it in the second column on 440, 448, you see a couple of bullets. It says relay station and processing station. Read that. Nothing heavy about it. Just tells you what it does. Okay. Nothing you can't handle. Come down to the second section on that second column on page 448. And you see it says protection of the spinal cord. And of course, what you've got in your hands, there's that study guide, Courtney. So uh, I've already sent it to you, even though we haven't finished the lecture yet. And so the cord is surrounded by the spinal meninges. Protects us. Boy, it takes a load. You know, you think about some of the sports we get into, you know, soccer and basketball. and We're always twisting and turning this way. And then football, you get hit this way and that way. Pretty tough body, isn't it? Even though it's really delicate, it's pretty tough. So those same membranes encase the spinal cord. <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, Courtney, I'll tell you. <clears throat> I'm sure Caitlin's agreeing with you, too. I understand. We'll get through it, though, and you'll get it straight. Just keep asking the question. We'll do it. So it gives you a nice picture on the next page, uh, figure 1222, structure of the spinal meninges. That's the title, structure of the spinal meninges. And you see a nice picture up top of a section that uh, shows you the pia mater and the subarachnoid space and the arachnoid mater and the dura. Let's go over to page 450. The title there is external, Sp excuse me, external spinal cord anatomy. Got a hiccup. So on, four, on 450, external spinal cord anatomy, I want you to come down in that first little paragraph and you see the bold print terms conus medullaris and the phylum terminale. If you come down to that picture that's underneath there, this is figure 1223, spinal cord or external structure of the spinal cord. You come down, and eventually on the right-hand side, as you go through those words, you'll see where the cord, the solid cord, ends in the structure called the conus medullaris. So the solid cord stops there around L2, something like that, L1 or L2. Then you see all these nerves that come down. They're just sort of hanging there. Not hanging there, obviously, but, but they're, they're separated. It's not a solid structure. And those nerves are called the cauda equina, horse's tail.
So it's right around, uh, somewhere around L3. They do what they call a spinal tap. Some of you have heard of people having that uh, procedure carried out. That's where they get some cerebrospinal fluid, put it on a slide, gram stain it, which doesn't mean anything to you at this point, but they'll stain it so they can see if there are any bacteria in there. And then they perhaps how to treat the situation. But anyway, you know the conus medullaris, and you know that the cords how to treat the situation. But anyway, you know the conus medullaris, and you know that the cords go on down in the phylum, <coughs> phylum alley, anchors, uh, the rest of the cord in down there in the coccygeal vertebra. Now, as you look at the picture of that uh, um, back of that person, the, the drawing, you see all the little nerves coming off, and those are spinal nerves. I want you to look at the top of the next column where it says uh, note in figure 1223A. And what I want you to do is start about six lines down where you see spinal nerves. We have 31 pairs of spinal nerves. And you see, as you read that sentence, it says the peripheral nervous system. Now, what we're going to do at this point is we're going to look at uh, page 451, internal spinal cord anatomy. And we're going to look at those nerves to some degree. So as you look on 451, first column under internal spinal cord anatomy. That is the title of that uh, section. And it's going to have a couple of um, subsections. So you come down and you see the picture at the bottom of the page. It's figure 1224. And you see the title says Overview of Internal Spinal Cord Structure and Function. And as you look at the picture and correlate it with the um, first paragraph up there, you see the central canal, and you can see the central canal is labeled. The label of it is on the left-hand side. But that hole is the central canal through which CSF flows. The next go, bra uh, um, bold print term is the gray commissure. Now, as you look at that picture below, figure 1224, it looks like some kind of a bug, doesn't it? Some people say it looks like a butterfly. But as you see, and I'm assuming that your color is fairly similar to mine, the, the butterfly looks kind of brown. And then the material surrounding it looks lighter. So the brown material consists of unmyelinated neurons, or perhaps we should say unmyelinated axons, because you don't go put myelin on the, the cell body and so forth. So those are unmyelinated, unmyelinated axons. Now, let's look at that butterfly for a minute. You want to know this diagram. You see the gray commissure, and you see that uh, up on the top of that section, that's the backside, posterior. You look to the left. Now, that gray matter is sensory in function. In other words, Messages are coming into the spinal cord through the posterior horn. It's sensory in function. 
Look over to the right and you'll see posterior root or posterior root. And you see sensory. And then you see a posterior root ganglion. Follow those blue lines. Ganglion is a group of um, cell bodies outside the central nervous system. Okay. Nuclei, which we typically think of as the nucleus in the cell, but it's, it's applied in a different way. Nuclei in the central nervous system are bodies of cell neurons, uh, cell bodies of neurons. And so you go on past, follow those blue or those green lines, and you see they go out to a blood vessel, visceral, okay, and somatic, your skin or to some of your muscles, the stretch receptors and things like that. Those nerves are sensory function. So we get sensation from the skin. Is it cold outside? Is it warm outside? Then you have the visceral sensory uh, component, which is blood vessels, organs, and so forth. And you see they carry messages from your skin, from your organs. When your muscles get stretched, somebody stretches it the wrong way, you can feel it, you're aware of it. They send impulses along that nerve. Those nerves that go back to the posterior root ganglion and into the posterior horn. And from there, it's gonna go up into your brain and you're gonna be aware of something in the environment the wind on your skin or some little bug crawling on you. I saw a bug the other day I was studying and that bug had six legs, but the body of that bug was no wider than a human hair. And I'm looking at it and going, you got to be kidding. There's a tiny little brain in there. There's a tiny little GI tract. There's a tiny little re reproductive tract. And I just thought, you got to be kidding. That is so small. Fascinating. Biology is just utterly fascinating. Okay. We're all right with the posterior, right? Now I want you to look at the anterior. That's toward the bottom of the picture. You see it says, on the left-hand side, anterior horn. That's motor in function. So is the lateral horn, motor in function. So you look over to the right and you just look at the lateral horn and the uh, anterior horn. Just transfer what you see on the left over to the right. And you see those red neurons those red axons coming out. They call that the anterior root, just like they called the top one, the back one called the posterior root. And the anterior root is motor in function. Follow those red lines. And you see one red line goes to a muscle. So you can contract your muscles. And you see another red line goes to your lungs. And notice it says visceral. They call smooth muscle there. But it's, it's a motor nerve going to what we would call visceral muscle. Muscle you don't con control up here. It's part of the autonomic nervous system. So when you get sensations that go uh, into the posterior root and go up to the brain, and maybe they, uh, you're aware that your tummy hurts or something like that, well, you may end up finding out that a message comes down on the lateral horn, goes out the spinal, the ventral root, and goes to some part of your GI tract, and you get diarrhea, trying to get rid of the problem that was causing the pain. What we've just been talked about talking about is right above the picture. Anterior horn, posterior horn, lateral horn. So make sure you understand that, okay?
Now, I want you to notice one other thing about the diagram. Well, one more thing. We've got something else to look at in just a second. But you see where it says on the right-hand side of the diagram, you see where the posterior root ganglion is, and, and then here comes the ventral root or the anterior root, and they join together, and they call that a spinal nerve. Spinal nerves are mixed nerves. What does that mean? It means that they carry sensory components and motor components. One more thing about this cross section. Look in the second column. And come down, you see spinal white matter. And any time you think white matter, think of myelinated axons. And as you read through that paragraph, it's going to talk about ascending and descending tracts. Myelinated. A tract is a group of myelinated axons. Ascending is another way of saying afferent, is another way of saying sensory. So tracks that go up are ascending. They're sending messages to our central nervous system. Obviously, the descending send their messages down from the brain. goes down the spinal cord, comes out, and goes to some sort of effector, which in most cases is going to be a gland or a, a skeletal muscle, something like that. Some sort of tissue that is going to cause an effect in the body, whether it's motion, whether it's a producing, production of a substance or whatever. So see, all those words mean the same thing. Motor, descending, okay? Efferent, efferent means to go away, afferent means to go toward, okay? So you can learn the new names, funiculus, that's another word for those uh, uh, number of tracts coming down. Now, the last thing I want you to know in terms of that spinal cord and these ascending and descending tracts, look on page 452. And you see up at the top, ascending tracks, sensory, okay? Look over to the right, you see descending tracks, motor. And don't worry about posterior columns, we're not going to get into all that. But what I want you to do is look at the figure. It's 1225. And for those of you, like Courtney, that need that title, it, the title is Ascending and Descending Tracts of the Spinal Cord. Now, look at the boxes to the right. Don't worry about identifying any of these tracks in the spinal cord. That's not my intent here. But look in the box. Now, the first box, the box that's on top, says ascending tract and function. Okay. I want you to come down one, two, three uh, rectangles in that box. And what does it say? It says spinocerebellar tract. Now that's a giveaway because the way, and this really makes sense, the way they labeled it or gave it a name, they um, gave it the origin and the terminal portions. So spinocerebellar originates in the cord, in the spinal cord, goes 
goes up to the cerebellum. So when you hear those names like that, the spinocerebellar tract, you say, oh, where in the world is that? Well, you already know about the cerebellum, and you don't know about the spine. They did something that's really, really very good in keeping you on track. First part of the word is the origin. Second part is the termination of it. It's kind of like saying, let's get on to the Florence Atlanta, Atlanta Highway. Well, everybody know where that is, right? That's I-20. Florence Atlanta. Atlanta Highway, or if you're from Atlanta, you'd say from the Atlanta to the Florence Highway. Same thing. Except you're not going up and down, you're going across the country. And look under descending track, the next box, and look at the first rectangle. And you see it says corticospinal track. That's a giveaway. Starts in the cortex, ends in the spine. So if you see some names like that, like spinothalamic or thalamospinal, see, you can figure out whether it's an ascending or descending tract. Just a little bit to apply. Okay. Now, let's see here. I'm flying way over here. Looks like I'm going to get to the end of chapter 13 or 12. Okay, yeah, now we're on chapter 13. Got two more chapters to go. We got about, <clears throat> what, 20 minutes. We'll get it done. 477, chapter 13. Chapter 13. And this book is 477. I'm going to be a few pages off, but look for chapter 13. The title is The Peripheral Nervous System. Now, you're not unfamiliar with that. You know that central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. So you've heard that before. What I want you to do is look at the bottom of page 477 or that first page in the chapter. The heading over there says 13.1, the overview of the peripheral nervous system. Just an overview, okay? Look at the last sentences. Right at the very bottom of the page, the peripheral nervous system links the CNS you know this, to the body the body, and to the external environment. The PNS does this by first detecting sensory stimuli and delivering, on the next page, to the CNS, the information is sensory input. So the CNS processes the input and then transmits the impulses down through the PNS to some sort of effector, skeletal muscles or glands. Look at the picture on page 478. It's figure 13-1. Figure 13-1. And it's called and entitled The Organization of the Peripheral Nervous System. Now, you already have some sort of a um, understanding of what that is. But look at the eye. You see over on the left, that's your peripheral nervous system, sensory in nature. The eye picks up a coyote. We had one run across the back of our pits last night, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Goes to your brain. In our case, we looked at it. My son and I were out there grilling, and we looked at it and said, that ain't no dog. That's a coyote. Just kind of whoop, 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 loping along. He'll eat your cats. He'll eat your dogs, anything you can get a hold of. So we processed that information. So, wait a minute, that's not a dog. Uh, that's not a regular dog, like a uh, you know, Labrador Retriever or something like that. 
course, we didn't do anything except sit there and keep grilling because he didn't bother us. But you see the red goes over from your spine, from your vertebral column to your muscles. And if it was coming toward us, we would have got inside the house. Coyotes should not come toward people unless some of these, there's some folks that live over across a, a, a um, couple of roads from us and they're giving uh, food out to foxes. Not smart. Foxes can carry rabies. Do not do that. Don't do that. Let them be wild animals. That's the way they were meant to be. But if something comes towards you, your eyes will pick up on it and you'll say, I don't need to be here. Let's get in the car, get in the house or whatever. So you see the sensory portion, you see the central portion, and you see the motor portion. See how they work together. Now they're going to restate this. In the second column on page 478, you see under the divisions of the PNS, it says sensory division. We've already talked about that. You go on over, you got a visceral sensory division, tells you how your tummy is or your bladder is or something like that. Then you come to the section called motor division. This is on 479. And you again find the somatic motor division. That's going to get your skeletal muscles going. And then you see visceral motor division. That's going to deal with your internal organs over which you don't have any control. You can't speed your GI tract up. And you can't sit here and say, beat faster, beat faster, heart. It just doesn't work like that. Homeostasis. Okay, these two systems. The visceral motor division is divided into uh, two parts. Well, actually, it's, uh, you see it says it's the uh, autonomic nervous system, independent. And you have two divisions. This is the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic you probably have heard of as the fight or flight. Division, parasympathetic is the rest and digest. They oppose each other and they can shift depending upon the situation. You go to sleep last night, uh, the parasympathetic pushes a little bit more, so your heart rate goes down, your GI tract is working to digest your supper. But if you come through a hurricane at 4 o'clock in the morning, forget about digestion, man. The heart's going to be pushing harder. You're going to be breathing deeper. Your muscles are going to be stronger. That's all part of the sympathetic nervous system. So they tend to oppose each other. Some people say they antagonize each other. I don't know that it's an antagonism, but it's homeostasis. It's keeping things balanced. If you need to run from a fire, well, sympathetic's going to kick in to get you out of there. But if you want to rest, you don't want that sympathetic system firing up. You'll never go to sleep. You'll be wide-eyed all night long. Okay? So read that about those uh, uh, the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems. In the next column, you see... Come on down to the about the second uh, paragraph. You see spinal nerves. You got 31 pairs of those. And we've already talked about the anterior root and the posterior root and so forth, and the anterior horn and the posterior horn. Then you see cranial nerves. I want you to look over on page 481, and you have a heading 13.2, the cranial nerves. At the bottom of page 481, they list the 12 cranial nerves. What I want you to know is the number and the name and the one and one function of each nerve. 
So when you look, say, at number three down at the bottom under remembering the cranial nerves, oculomotor. Okay, so there's number three. The name is oculomotor. And this one's a pretty easy one. Oculo is eye. Motor means it moves your eye. You turn your eyes one way, turn them the other way, raise them up. You look above, you look below. So it connects with muscles that will help us move our eyes. So the number, the name, and one function. They have a number of functions. Okay, let's do this. We'll skip a lot of pages here. And look on page 491. You're looking for a Title, we're into spinal nerves, 13.3. And then a subheading underneath there is structure of spinal nerves and spinal nerve plexuses. Now, it's the spinal nerve plexuses that I'm interested in you knowing. Just basically as an understanding, small understanding, in definition, in that column, structure of spinal nerves and spinal nerve plexuses, come down one, two, three, four paragraphs in that first column. And you see it says 31 pairs of spinal nerves, and then it gives you the number of the, the uh, particular ones like the cervical and the thoracic and all that. Don't worry about that. But you see the bold print term, nerve plexuses. Spinal nerves come together to form complicated networks of nerves. The axons of each spinal nerve cross over um, one another to enter different plexus branches. It looks like a mess, but it's not. And so those nerves innervate various parts of our body. I want you to look over I'll get there in just a second. Well, did I miss it? Maybe I missed it. Sometimes pages stick together. Ah, I got it. Go over to page 504. And you see this person uh, painted in different colors in different parts of the body uh, is marked off. I'm interested in you knowing about those dermatomes. I give you a definition there. Segments that spinal cord, excuse me, spinal nerves innervate. So if somebody has a problem out here on the lateral circle, well, it would be the medial surface if you're staying in the anatomical position. The medial surface of the palm that's going to be along here. There's a nerve that innervates that. There's another nerve that innervates this. So if somebody's got a problem in this area, they know where it's happening in the neck area. And they start looking for maybe a um, swollen or maybe a a ruptured disc, a bulging disc of some kind. You probably saw that in your um, 
your lab, we had a bulging lumbar disc. Puts pressure on nerves. And it affects other parts of your body. So you want to know about dermatomes. You can read about them. And I want you to go back to page 497. Figure 13.9. And by that figure 13.9, it says the sacral plexus. And you already know plexus is a group of nerves that cross over with each other, sometimes hook to each other. But what I want you to notice on that page, 497, in the picture of that person's right leg and hip, look on the chart and you see sciatic nerve. That's the longest nerve in the body. Some people like Shaquille O'Neal probably have a four foot, uh, three and a half foot uh, sciatic nerve. Somebody who's short wouldn't have one that long. It'd be the longest one in their body, but just might not be as long as other people. Now, let's scoot over to page 508, 13.6. 508's the page, 13.6 is the section in chapter 13. And you look at the bottom, and I want you to read that little section about reflex arcs. Reflex arcs. And gives you a little picture up at the top, how you have a sensory component, a central uh, control center, and then a motor component. Those are the three components of a reflex arc. Reflex, you don't have to think about carrying that out. You simply do it. It's a reflex. My father asked me when I was a cadet at the Citadel, he asked, asked me if I could get off one weekend, and he was going to be over there with his with mom and um, go play some golf. He wanted me to come out and play some golf. We hit a golf ball in a creek, and we were walking a little bit down the creek that the grounds here, you know, and then it dropped off about three feet or something like that, three and a half feet. And uh, we're looking for that ball. And all of a sudden we hear this huge hiss. And both of us knew that was a gator. We were in somebody's territory. And in an instant, we leaped. And my dad's 60 years old when he did that. He leapt right out of that creek and was on the bank. Just like that, poof. My mother thought that was so funny. She was 15, 20 yards away. Just all of a sudden, both of us just left right, left the ground and got right on top of that bank. That was a reflex. We didn't have to sit there and have a powwow about it. Get the heck out of here, man. And we did. So now you know about reflexes. Now let's go over to chapter 14. Chapter 14 is on the autonomic nervous system. Page 518, title, Autonomic Nervous System and Homeostasis. I want you to read the first two little paragraphs there as you introduce that about the autonomic nervous system. And on the next page, you see it says, Functions of the ANS and Visceral Reflex Arcs. Um, Our GI tract uh, is innervated by the autonomic nervous system. So we have reflex arcs there. You come over to the right, you see comparison of somatic and auto autonomic nervous systems. Notice the picture, figure 14.2. 
Figure 14.2, entitled Comparison of the Somatic and Autonomic Nervous Systems. Notice both of the neuron cell bodies start out in the spinal cord. In the somatic nervous system, there's one long axon that goes to an effector. Voluntary. You got control over it. The one below? That's an autonomic nervous system cell body of a neuron in the cord. And you see it has to attach to another cell body. And then it goes to some sort of effector. And that is involuntary. So you got two neurons running the track to get a message out to some effector in the autonomic system in the somatic system, just one neuron. You will see that on page 520, the next page where you see in bold print the preganglionic and the postganglionic neuron. Now remember, we talked about a ganglion, talked about nuclei and ganglia. The ganglion is where nerve, nerve cell bodies are. So the preganglionic neuron is in the central nervous system that's in the spinal cord, runs its um, um, axon out to a ganglion and combines with a postganglionic neuron. And then that goes to an effector. So if they're physically different, I want you to read about the, when you see the divisions of the autonomic nervous system on page 520, Read through that, sympathetic nervous system, parasympathetic nervous system. Nothing hard about it. Just read about it and be very familiar with it so I can ask you some questions, get a foundation. On page 523, there is a heading called Sympathetic Neurotransmitters and Receptors. Ooh, we're a little bit over time here. If any of you got to go, I understand that. We're just about at the end. You see classes of sympathetic neurotransmitters. You already know them. Neuro, norepinephrine, epinephrine, so forth. Acetylcholine, dopamine. Okay. Look in the second column and you see sympathetic receptors, adrenergic and cholinergic. Adrenergic receptors, you look down a little bit, they're the ones that respond to um, norepinephrine and epinephrine. And look over on page um, 524, you see about beta receptors, you got alpha receptors and beta receptors. Those are the little parts that pick up the neurotransmitter from the telodendria, and you get some kind of effect. And you see in the second column on page 524, beta blockers. Some people stay on beta blockers because they have a heart problem. Some people's heart wants to beat too fast, so they put them on a beta blocker. So it would attach to a beta receptor and prevent the heart from uh, um, going too fast. It decrease its rate and decrease its force of contraction. Okay, the last thing. Yep, the last thing on page 526. This is just some specifics that you already know. Now, remember, in general, the sympathetic wants to stimulate the body and the parasympathetic wants to decrease that stimulation, rest and digest. So when you look on 526 and you see effects on cardiac muscle cells, sympathetic is going to 
make the cells contract more quickly. So parasynthetic is going to make them slow down. You look in the second column and you see dilation, dilation of the bronchioles. Synthetic is going to dilate the bronchioles so more air can come in. Parasynthetic is going to close it down because you're being still. Same thing with blood vessels. And you got a couple other things I think on your hand out there that I want you to know about cholinergic receptors. Got my own study guide here. You see cholinergic receptors on that study guide on page seven. The other ones that acetylcholine. Uh, excites, and you see muscarinic receptor, which means it'll bind with the poison from some fungi and can kill you. We have those receptors, and then nicotinic receptors, that's where nicotine from cigarettes can create problems. Do you have any questions? Anybody breathing out there? Well, today is Tuesday, so you will have your fifth exam this Thursday. That's your fifth exam. As far as I know, the following Thursday will be your final exam. They've extended the semester a little bit. We don't have to turn in grades until I think the date is the 20th of May. Okay, as you're studying, if you have a question, let's see. <laughs> I know how you feel. Chapters 12 through 15. So you'll, in 15, it'll just be what we've already covered in terms of the eye. Remember the retina and the cones and the rods and so forth like that. Any other questions? If while you're studying, uh, you hit up on something, you talk to some people, maybe you can't quite come to a consensus on how you're to understand something, then shoot me an email. You know, I go to sleep at night. I don't stay on duty 24-7. But, uh, you know, I always check it in the morning. So let me know if you have a question. Well, yeah, sure. I'll have to put that in to, you know, you know, I don't know how you're doing in the lab, but I know you got homework quizzes and I know you got uh, uh, that their homework quizzes are going to be put together and divided by however many home, home, homework quizzes you were supposed to do. That's going to count as a test, lecture test. And then your final, if you do real well on that, you know, it can replace one of your lowest grades. And then who you guys got, Boggs, Mr. Boggs or Mr. Davis? And so uh, they'll turn in a, a lab grade to me.
I think you probably have your lab exam this week, don't you? Or is it going to be next week also? You got a lab exam this week too? Going to be a crowded week, isn't it? So you got two exams. I hope you've been studying all along. That's the only way to survive. You can't cram it. It just doesn't work. I tried it. Maybe you guys are better at cramming than I am. But I couldn't do it. I've got to go at it all the time. My life had to be studying. If I wasn't doing guard duty, I was studying. Or maybe working out a little bit. Okay, I'm going to end this stream unless somebody else has a question within the next 10 seconds. Okay, see you in a little while.